Let's pray. God, you are an amazing God. And we come before you this morning just continuing to worship you for who you are, for what you do in our lives and what you have done for us. I pray that this morning that you would receive all the glory, that our eyes would be drawn to you, that our hearts would be pierced, that, that we would see you more clearly, that we would see ourselves more humbly, and that we would just relish in the love that you have for us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for walking with us every day. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good morning. I'm Jonathan. I'm one of the pastors here at the Cross. If you're a guest and I haven't met you, I'd love to meet you. So please stop me on the way out um, and uh, shake my hand or give me a fist bump or whatever. But um, it's good seeing you guys. It's, it is cold. It is really cold. So uh, kudos to you guys. And uh, if you're joining us on YouTube, I understand. Um, no, um, but yeah, it, what, what great worship. What do we just sing? What do we just sing about? Let's just kind of, and, and for the sake of people who will later on be watching this video who don't get to see or listen to the worship piece of this, we just, we sing about a God who chases us down, who loves us, right? And there's nothing that's going to keep him from running us down, despite us running away as much as we possibly can. And maybe you can say, like, right now I'm running away like crazy. Um, or maybe you can go, yeah, no, I remember my history. I, I was running away and God caught me, right? And those are beautiful stories. And then we sang about, and it's a happy day. And, and that song is, is incredible, right? Because it's talking about, you know, like the happy day now when we, when we understand and when we come to a saving faith in Christ, but also the happy day of like when that comes to full consummation and we're legit with God in heaven and like how happy of a day that's going to be, right? And so we, we look at both of those things and we're like, man, this is incredible, and then we just saying that, that Jesus, the name of Jesus is wonderful and powerful and beautiful. That, that is emotion. It's emotion. And I've said this many times up here. I, well, I also qualify it too because I cry so frequently from here. But I'm, I'm a very analytical guy. Like for me, it's very, it's mathematical. It's puzzles, it's puzzle pieces. This is the most consistent, coherent uh, revelation of God that, that makes sense to me. And so logically, for me, it's, it's very clear, but it's not just that. It can't just be that. It's, it's the declaration that, that the name of Christ is powerful in our lives because tomorrow when we wake up, chaos awaits. In two hours from now, chaos awaits may be lurking at the door. It might be right outside of that door. And you may get the text. And all of a sudden, the, the power of Jesus' name becomes something. It's, it's not that anything changes about Jesus. It's just that at, at the point where everything, seem, everything seems to be falling apart, now we, we go, God's sovereign. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean that God's sovereign? It means it wasn't an accident. It means that, that in this, we, we go back to Romans 8, 28, and that he does all things for the good of those who love him. And so we go, this isn't just randomness. This isn't just karma. This isn't just things come around and things happen. This is, this is that God is doing something, orchestrating something, as bad as it may seem, as painful as it may be. We can rejoice in suffering because we know it's for our good. That's salvation. That's what the Holy Spirit gives us. That's why we say Jesus' name is powerful. That's why we can point to that and we can say it's a happy day. Because every day we grow happier and happier because we see more and more of Christ's work in our lives and his sovereignty in the world around us. And so this morning we're going to look at this from a, from a salvation perspective. 
okay? We're going to look at this. We've been, we've been talking about living a life on mission. What does that mean? It means all that we just sang and all that I just spoke about, does that create emotion in us? Because <laughs> it should. It should. I mean, we should be sober-minded in the world and passionate about Christ. But I feel like we've got it flip-flopped. I feel like we're very sober-minded when it comes to Christ, and we're very passionate about dumb things in the world. <laughs> Why? Why is it like that? Because it's like that for me. I mean, I, you can ask my daughters. I, I will be very passionate about many things, and sadly, I don't think I'm as passionate about the gospel as I should be in my own home. I'm more passionate on this stage than I am sitting around the dinner table. Why? Well, because I'm afraid. I don't want my kids to, to just think this is like an emotional thing. Like, there's, there's a reason why I believe what I believe. Let me, let's dig through it. And you can imagine how exciting my kids are. Right? You guys can picture this. Hey, look, but did you see this? And then look at this word, right? You're like, man, glad I'm not there. But it's not, it's not and or. It's not, it's not or. It's, it's and. It's both. It's both emotion and this, this knowledge, and this is what we're going to see. So we're going to start off in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. And I'm going to read through all of it, and then we're going to back up. I think that's what I'm going to do. That is what I'm going to do. All right, verse, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. The verses will be on the screen. I'll be reading from the ESV. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This is salvation. This is what we just read is God's plan of salvation. How he rescues us. You just read that, right? And, and, and Paul, Paul kind of like backs it up as he does this, right? He, and he walks through all this, and it starts with salvation of this person, right? And then he backs it all the way up to what? God sending us. God sending people to what? To preach. And it does, that's, this, that's, not just, that's not just me. I just got really bright. <laughs> nice. um, is that what it's supposed to be? Okay, good. Uh, so, and it's not just, um, sorry. Um, so we go, we go to preach. And, and those who preach, right, we, we do that so that they would hear. And they hear it, they hear the gospel, and they believe it. And then they believe it, and what do they do? They call on the Lord. And so that, well, the whole thing starts with what? God sending us. You guys realize that? God sent you. If you call Christ your Savior, if you're singing these songs, if you confess Christ as your Lord, God has sent you into the world to preach so that others would hear. How did you come to faith? How did you hear the gospel? I mean, could God reveal himself to you without some other person telling you about the gospel? Yes. Does he normally? No. No. And I would venture to guess that all of you, the vast majority of you, heard the gospel from somebody. Maybe somebody standing on the stage, maybe a family member, maybe a friend. 
maybe on TV, flipping through the channels, <laughs> you know, right? Like, like you heard the gospel through people, through people like you. And there's people outside, right? So when we're talking about living a life on mission, like we have been sent on mission to go and proclaim the gospel. We can't get around that. In fact, so let's, we're going to back up to verse 9 here. And listen to, what he, listen to what he says. He says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. That's it. Justification. Saved, rescued. That's, that's the great exchange right there, right? That's Christ's righteousness for our sins. And the swap happens. And now you have Christ's righteousness and Christ takes your sins. That, that's, that's justification. And what does he say? For with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You see, if you, if you believe, you will confess. You will, you will proclaim, you will declare your dependency on Christ. You will confess your weakness. That's what he's pointing to here. You see, we, we've gotten into this, this habit of thinking, well, I can just believe intellectually, and maybe I believe that there's God out there and he's going to determine that I'm good enough. And eh, we'll see what happens. It's not what he's pointing to here. With your mouth, you confess your weakness, that Jesus' name is powerful and wonderful and beautiful. That's what you confess. He says, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And he, when he says this, distinct, for there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, realize that what he's trying to say is this is everybody. In this world, when they were talking, you were either Jewish or you were not Jewish, <laughs> And it'll, they'll use it interchangeably, either Greek or Gentile, but that's, that's the idea. So don't think that this is just talking about two types of people. This is talking about everybody. You're either in the circle or you're outside of the circle, okay, in, in, in this context. He says, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. If you have a Bible, I want you to underline that. It, well, if you have a physical Bible or a digital one, you want to highlight it. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You have to call on the name of the Lord. This isn't some like hocus pocus thing. This is, this is saying that you depend on God. That's what he's saying. Right? You, this, isn't just, this doesn't just sit without an emotional component to this. It's not all emotion. Right, but, it, but there's an emotional component of going, I need God. You, if you call Christ your Savior, at some point you declared that, right? And you went, I'm sinful. I have no way of cleaning myself up. There's not enough good deeds I could do that would mask my bad deeds, my sins, my rebellion. Like, it's still there. There's nothing I can do. I can, I can try to start living a better life, but it doesn't do anything of what I've done. How do I fix this? And, and tomorrow I'm going to sin again. I'm going to rebel again. And so how do I fix what's going to happen in the future? And we, what we say is, God, I'm weak. I can't save myself. I need you. That's calling on the Lord. It's when you, it's when you wake up in the morning and you're just overcome by the tension and the stressors of life. And you go, I don't want to get out of bed. You go, I need you, God. I need you this morning. Give me strength. You call on the name of the Lord when, when you're doubting and you're wondering what the purpose of all these things are in your life and you're just wondering, like, I miss it. Am I going the wrong way? And you call on the name of the Lord and you ask for wisdom, for discernment. You see, we, we call on the name of the Lord in our weakness, when we understand, when we have a real, true accountability of what we've got to bring. Because it's not much. And we go, the reality is that we don't have enough within ourselves to make it through the day. And it's by God's grace 
that we can declare that he is sovereign and that he gives us the strength. We were actually just talking about this earlier, right? Like this is why Jesus left. He left so that we could have the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit would dwell in us and be our counselor. The fact that you have a counselor inside of you means that you need counseling. Right? John, we were just talking about this. Like this is how this works. If you didn't need counseling, he wouldn't have given you a counselor. If you didn't need help, he wouldn't have given you a helper. And that's exactly who our God is. And so this calling on the name of the Lord, realize I want you guys to get this because it seems like I would have stopped this if, if I were writing this, which I'm, I'm not, I'm not claiming I should, right? Like when I get to the believe part, I would stop and I'd go, this is it. This is, that's all we need. And how often do we say this? You just need to believe. Yes, but it's trust. It's, there's, our language isn't good enough. It's belief at the level of, of trust. I don't want you to trust me. You shouldn't trust your spouse for eternity. You trust in Christ. See, and that's the problem. We're passionate about all these things in our life because we find contentment in them temporarily. We find some happiness in these things in our lives, and we go, this is the good stuff. And God's going, no, that's not the good stuff. You just wait. I've got the good stuff for you, where you can declare, oh, happy day for all eternity. So this, so this is salvation. This is what he's talking about. The, the end state is that they would call on the name of the Lord, that you would call on the name of the Lord. If you're at the point right now where you're like, I don't feel like I live like that, I would ask you to spend some time on your knees praying and go, who am I and who do I think I am in light of the creator of the universe? And I guarantee you that if you're honest with yourself, you're going to be asking and you're going to be calling on the name of the Lord by the time you're done. Because that's who he is. And if we just take the time to put ourselves in this right relationship with him, we would see him for that. And there would be no belief that's just this intellectual belief. It would be a belief that trusts in God alone. And so how, how does the world get to the point where they call on the name of the Lord? They got to hear. They've got to hear. Look, look at what it says in verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? There you go. There's, there's the steps. Preach, hear, believe, call on the Lord. That's what happens. If you've got a family member, a friend, a neighbor, or whatever, and you're like, or a kid, or a parent, or what, and you're like, I know they don't call on the name of the Lord. They say they believe, but I know they're not calling on the name of the Lord. You guys get this, this distinction here, right? This is such an important distinction. Let me give you an example. Um, I've got a 2000 Toyota Tundra. Well, my middle daughter thinks she has it, but it, it's fine. Um, she has it temporarily. It's, it's a good truck. It works. It drives me from place to place. It's got a check engine light on, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think it does. Um, transmission's a little rough. <laughs> it's got some rust. <laughs> but it works. The bed of the truck has definitely some holes in it. But it works. I think this is how we see faith. I think this is how we see other people. Like, I could recommend to you my 2000 Toyota Tundra. Say, so, yeah, it's a great truck. It's got like 240,000 miles on it. It's still running. It's great. Other than when I jacked up the transmission, it's, it's never had a problem. <laughs> I tried to fix it. It didn't work. Um, but you have your own car. Y'all got here. Presumably by an automobile. I don't know. Let's just assume you did. How am I to tell you that my truck is better than your automobile? In fact, maybe your automobile is worse than my truck. 
Maybe it breaks down all the time. And I go, you know, I was telling you, you should buy Toyota. <laughs> There's probably some people in here that are squirming. Okay, whatever. Whatever it is, right? You guys get the metaphor. Who, who am I to tell you that like this one, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an automobile. It gets me where I need to go. Isn't this how we see often religion? You've got your religion, you've got your thing, you, you seem to be, you're upright, you're operating, you're, you, you've got a brain, things are going on. Who am I to tell you that like this is better than yours? I think that's how we see it. And so I don't want to jump into your chili telling you that, that man, your, your automobile just isn't good enough. It's not very good. Just trust me, this one's better. I think that's how we... This is, this is where we miss this in the gospel because the gospel is this automobile that doesn't need gas and it never breaks down. <laughs> and it doesn't have a check engine light on it. I mean, that's what he's saying here is like, like we've got this gospel and we're like, man, I'm, ju I'm just telling you, I know you've got something, but it's not good and it's not gonna work. You might be able to string that thing out to 300,000 miles, but then it's gonna die your, your religion, your, your, your karma, your, your belief in whatever is not going to hold light, what life has in store. And that's what we as parents should be telling our kids, right? Like I know like right now you, you've got mom and dad and, and we're, we're helping, but, but at some point you're going to go out of the nest and you're going to have to now navigate these waters on your own. And I'm telling you, these other things just aren't going to work. There is one thing that works, and that's Jesus. Why? Not because we just picked one. Because legitimately, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us, comforts us, counsels us, convicts us, directs our thoughts, helps us to rely on the sovereignty of God, and we can get up out of the bed in the morning and go, I'm trusting in God today. And he's with me, and he's for me, and he's not against me. And it doesn't matter what I did yesterday. Because he's forgiven me already. This automobile is worth the trade in. And here's the beautiful part it doesn't cost a thing, it's a free car. <laughs> it's price is right, right? Like, you get a free car. How? how? Say, God, I need you. I'm calling on the name of the Lord, I'm calling on you, God. Help me. Point me in the right direction. Show me how weak I am. Oh, if we would just boast in our weakness. If we would just really go before God and go, I'm actually really weak. Because I can't do the things that I want to do, and I, don't do the, and I do the things I don't want to do. That's how I know I'm weak. And I think we can all relate to that. So they've got to hear this. And we got to go, I got a good car for you. Let me tell you about the gospel. And, and man, I, I ran through some statistics. And, and this one was, um, I didn't write it down, so I probably should have. But, but from 2000 to 2010 in St. John's County, those who uh, are Christians, I think is what the verbiage was, those who are Christians went from like 70% to like 53%. I couldn't find one for 2020, which was a little bothersome. Even the 2020 census didn't have any questions that I could find. We've got a world out there that may declare that they're Christians, but they still may not know the gospel. You guys get that, right? And this is a very clear, like, there's a point in here where you gotta go, no, 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 here's the gospel. And this is where Paul says this, that, that we must preach. There's a difference between just telling people, oh, well, you know, following Christ is this, and, and, and here's the comparison or whatever. He says, we must preach, right? Like, that's what he says. That word preach means proclaim. There, dude. <laughs> if 
For those of you who are online, the kids just went screaming. Thanks, Kendall and Caleb. So I, I, before service, I, I promise I didn't, uh, I didn't set a timing or anything, but before service, I'm like, guys, have fun. Enjoy the kids, you know. I go, and it's totally cool when they scream. I'm like, honestly, I love it when they scream. I, like, I, I kid you not, this was the conversation I had about 30 minutes ago with them. And they're like, are you sure? Because we'll, we'll do it. I'm like, do it. I'm like, whenever. It'll be great. <laughs> that was impeccable timing. All right. So we must preach and proclaim. This isn't go and tell. In fact, that song like go tell on the mountain, right? I'm not going to sing it for you. <laughs> tell. Like what a boring word. Isn't that a boring word? Hey, go, go tell them. And I think that's how we see it. Like, yeah, go, go, go tell. Go tell some people. It's not what he says. He says, preach. Proclaim. Declare who God is in your life. Declare what the gospel is, the power of the gospel. And this is, this is why when we live a life on mission, it's not just about going around thumping people on the head with the Bible going, hey, just, just read it and then you'll understand. Just, I don't know. I like it. My car works better than yours, I think. I go, yeah, I don't know. I like my car. No. It's preach. It's proclaim. It's declare. Be passionate about it. And I get it. I'm standing up here, and I'm passionate often. Sometimes I weep, right? But this is what we need to take. This, this, isn't, he, this is not calling preachers to preach. You guys get this, right? This is calling us to preach, us to proclaim. I just happen to do it standing two feet higher because God has called me to that. But he calls all of us to preach. In fact, if you're a follower of Christ in here, I'm not preaching to you. I'm actually equipping you. By Ephesians 4's standard, I'm equipping you guys to go and serve and to preach the gospel. Now, if you aren't a follower of Christ in here, I am preaching to you. <laughs> right? Does it matter? No. So we go out and for those who know Christ, we're equipping and we're encouraging and we're exhorting each other. And for those who don't know Christ, we're preaching and proclaiming the gospel. That is what our life is about. That's what we are called to do. Now, you may be going, well, I don't know what to say. And that's totally valid. And I would ask you guys to really sit down and think about how God has moved in your life. Because that's what he calls us to preach. The power of the Holy Spirit that has worked in our lives in unique ways, in real ways. And I'm not trying to get you to like spiritualize some normal type of thing. Okay? So, and we can talk through this, right? You don't want to spiritualize every aspect because then it's like, okay, well, your whole life is like this weird spiritual thing. You know what I mean? It's like, like there are some very clear points in probably all of your lives where you can go, I can't explain that. I don't know. God worked in this way. And parents, we are called to account for those. We ought to be communicating those to our kids. We should be. I don't do it nearly as much as I, I should. Because it's those things, it's those rocks on the shore of the Jordan where you're going, no, 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 we're going to come back here and I'm going to point back to these things over and over again because this is where God moved in my life. And you can't say he didn't because I can tell you he did. And we each have different stories and we have different places. And maybe right now you're hopeful of a time when God, that, that maybe this is the time that God is moving in your life for something that's going on in your world. And you're going, I'm looking forward to being able to stack this rock on the side of the shore and be able to come back here and visit this. Because right now this is horrible. But five years from now, I'm praying that I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at it and I'm going to go, wow, look at what God was doing. That's where our faith and our trust in the sovereignty of God matters. So look at what it says in verse 16. Because here, here's what I want you guys to capture. You don't have to have this complete 
assessment of Scripture locked inside of your brain and be able to reference all these passages and be able to defend it, right? We've talked about this in the past, right? Your job is not to defend it. God's word is gonna defend it for himself. Look at what it says in verse 16. He says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. What he's saying is, despite the preaching, despite everybody listening and hearing the gospel, not everybody is gonna believe. Not everybody is gonna call on the name of the Lord. It says, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So what Paul is saying here is, it's not your words. It's the word of Christ. In fact, if you, and I'll, I'll get you a little more explanation here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Your job, you were sent by God to proclaim God's power in your life, to proclaim the gospel, what Jesus has done for us. To some people, it's going to be folly. It's going to be ridiculous. It's going to be foolishness. That's what he says here. So don't, so don't think you're inadequate or you're not doing the right thing or you're not saying the right thing. You guys, there's many a times when you go, I'm just, I, I, I feel like there's an opportunity here for me to plant a seed. I'm gonna say something and then I'm just, my, and then I just leave it. God does the work. You cannot make a single person in this room, I don't care how closely you know them, you can't make them call on the Lord. You can't, I can't make, I can't say the right words and you're gonna go, oh, I'm gonna start calling on the name of the Lord now. It's not gonna happen. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. It's God that does that. It's God that changes hearts. We're called to do our part. God does the changing. We're still called to do our part. Turn over one more uh, chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter two. And this is beautiful because And I would encourage you to go back to this because this is how Paul preached the gospel. Listen to this. It says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'm just going to pause there for a second. I wonder if Paul was a good tent maker. Maybe he was really good at it. Maybe he rolls into town, he's like, let me show you guys how to make some good tents. And they're like, wow, this guy's a good tent maker. And he preaches the gospel. Have you heard about his story? He says, I decided, Paul made a decision. Doesn't matter if I can make a tent good or not. The rest of my life, irrelevant. What I want you to know is the gospel. And that's what he says here. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So that your faith, underline this if you've got your Bible, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Don't trust me. Trust in God. Paul goes, dude, I don't even want to be in the picture. I just just want you to see the cross. I I, I want to step back. I want to proclaim the gospel, and I want to get out of the way. That's how we're called to proclaim. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you guys what I know and you guys are gonna go out and you're gonna tell people what you know and then you're gonna step back and you're gonna get out of the way and you're gonna let God do the work because only he can do the work. All right, go back to Romans chapter 10, verse 15. So listen to this. So we're called to preach and then he says, And how are they to preach, verse 15, unless 
they are sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. You see, we are sent. We are sent. That's where this started. We were sent by God to go and proclaim. When he calls us, when, when we confess Christ as our Lord, he goes, awesome, get up, go. Go. Go proclaim. That's not a work. That's not for you to d- be determined that you're righteous and that you've now earned your salvation. No, no, you are saved. Now go tell others about how you got saved. Go and tell others about what the Holy Spirit has done in your life. Go tell others how God's power and, his, and trust in him and his sovereignty is a, is a foundational staple of your every morning. You don't need Wheaties, you need God. That's the point, and that's what he's calling us to do. Your words, your life, your daily life is sent. That's why you exist. That's why you woke up this morning. It's why you might wake up tomorrow. Because God wants you to go. And he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Now, he's referencing Isaiah 52, and we'll get to that here in a bit, but I want you to put yourself in this context. The feet of somebody who's bringing good news probably weren't clean. They didn't have nails trimmed. They didn't have one of those little, like, fish-eating pedicures the day prior. It's not what he's pointing to. What makes them beautiful? They've been sent. They're obedient. They're going. That's why they're beautiful. Because from God's economy, from God's perspective, he goes, those are beautiful feet. You know why? Because they're out going and telling people the good news. That's what makes them beautiful. If, if there is a verse, if there's a scripture here that talks to the difference between what the world sees as outer beauty and what God sees as an inner beauty, and this is, this is to all of us in here, but especially the women, it's this. We spend so long perfecting and thinking and watching about what the world calls beauty. And it's not that. It's not that. And yet this is the most beautiful part of all of us is when we're living in obedience to God's will and we're going and we're proclaiming the good news in our lives, God goes, that's beautiful. You know why? Because it costs you something. You ready to get your feet dirty? You okay with getting your feet dirty? Because you're going to get your feet dirty so that they can hear the gospel. Last week we talked about the costs of following Jesus. There you go. Are you ready to get sore, swollen, aching feet for the gospel? Because that's where God declares that they're beautiful. When they're red and swollen, they hurt, and you can't hardly stand up anymore. And he goes, yeah, but I'm preaching the gospel. It's worth it. And it's not your feet, right? You get, the, you get the analogy here. What he's saying is that when we're living in obedience to God and we're out and we're living the purpose of our life and it's, it's coming to fruition, our lives are beautiful. So go to Isaiah 52. And Paul quotes Isaiah throughout here. In fact, um, after we finish up with this series, we're going to go through Isaiah. Um, not the, we're going to hit some wave tops, okay? We're not going like, to go through like, the whole thing verse by verse. But But Paul jumps back to Isaiah, and it it is such a magnificent book, and if if this is something, like, I I would point you to it and go, man, go and read some of these things because they are absolutely incredible. Listen to what he says in Isaiah chapter 52, uh, verse 6. I think that's where I'm starting. Yeah, verse 6. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day they shall know it is I who speak, here I am. 
Verse 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation. That word publishes, this is Hebrew now, right? Same, similar word for preaching and proclaiming, right? So, so here it is, right? The, the person who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes or proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God is reigns. God reigns. That's, that's the proclaiming. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. What he's saying here is you've got these watchmen, right, who are, who are waiting and protecting the city, and, and they're sitting here, and they're, they're the watchmen. They're, they're responsible for everybody, and what do they see, right? Like, they're looking, and they're waiting for the Lord to come back. They're waiting for Jesus' return. That's, that's the analogy. That, that's what he's communicating here. He says in verse 9, break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. And he's talking, again, Isaiah's talking to, about Israel and Jerusalem, but it applies to us now as children of Abraham, right? As, as children of faith. He says, The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. That's what he says in verse 11. Depart. Depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing. Now, he's, he's talking about them being in captivity and living in the world, in this, in this uh, prisoners, basically. And he's saying, like, go out from them. Don't be a part of that world. Go. Go out from the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord, for you shall not go out in haste, and you shall not go in flight. Saying, you're not, you're not escaping. You're not running away. We're to go. He says, For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. You see, Paul points back to Isaiah 52, going, going, This, this has been talked about already. We are to go. We are to go and proclaim. We are to be the watchmen going. The Lord is coming back. Proclaim salvation. And to say, <laughs> you got to hear this good news. This is what he's pointing at. And it's not. It's not with eloquent words of wisdom or amazing, perfect understanding of absolutely everything because God is going to go before you and God is going to go after you and God is going to do the heart changing. But you are to go and proclaim. And so whatever context that is in your life, this is what he's saying. We, you, he sent you. He sent you. We're sent by God. That needs to rest on us. Do you feel sent? Do you feel like this is your life's purpose? Or do you feel like this is some sort of side thing? I mean, I've, got, I've, got to, I've got to live my life. This is a life. These words are life. And this is what God has called us to do. We're all preachers. Let's go and preach. Let me pray.